How was Montana? Montana was great. <laughs> Montana was Tell great. Tell our tens of listeners the glory of Montana. All right, tens of listeners. I uh, I got to spend a week in Montana. It's my third or fourth time going out there to uh, to hang out and do a little fly fishing trip, mm-hmm. which was a lot of fun. Uh, fly into Bozeman, Montana and drive about three hours uh, from Bozeman towards uh, the town of Big Timber. The town of Big Timber is not very big. Uh, but it is a fascinating, really, really cool place. The Big Timber is right on the uh, the Boulder River and the and the Yellowstone River. Oh, so the, cool. the Boulder and the Yellowstone kind of converge there. The Yellowstone flows, of course, into the park that na- bears its name in Wyoming, the Yellowstone uh-huh. National Park. And Big Timber is not too far from Livingston, Montana. And Livingston, Montana is the site of the original entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Hmm. And eventually they, they created another entrance in Wyoming. So most people, if they're going into Yellowstone, go in through uh, through Wyoming, not through, not through Montana. Oh, interesting. But you can access the park from both places. That's so cool. Yeah. I didn't know. So from big timber, you basically drive out, there's a a road called Boulder road Mm -hmm. and you drive out on that road. And, uh, eventually you get to St. Joseph's church. It's about two blocks away from the center of big timber. And at St. Joseph's church, the road turns right and you can only turn right because there's nowhere else to go. You turn right with the road and you are no longer in big timber. You are in ranch country and you follow the Boulder river along the Boulder road through this ranch country, uh, until you get to the falls to natural bridge natural bridge is uh actually the boulder river runs right through some rock and creates a natural bridge it's like (laughs) it's like they just got really creative with their naming right (laughs) i'm assuming big timber means that there's a lot of timber around there's not it's really it's ranch country there's not a whole lot of trees okay never (laughs) mind you would would think but once was maybe maybe there once was a lot of timber there that's right yeah anyway so at at right after the natural bridge um which is where the boulder river separates between the lower boulder river and the upper boulder river because it's a big waterfall yeah so above the water fall is the upper boulder river and uh, it's not far after natural bridge that the pavement gives out and turns into a dirt road and you follow the dirt road for another so the the longest part of the trip is actually the 20 or 30 miles along the dirt road okay to where we're going yeah um, because the, the road is so rough in certain places especially the last 10 miles or so the road is so rough that you have to go really really slow mm. uh, so it just takes forever to get there Anyway, um, so every day, this group of, uh, there were 12 of us total. So every day we had uh, morning prayer, mass, then we ate breakfast, and then we went fishing. And we fished along the Boulder River every day, and it was it was fantastic. The first day was really good. The second day was super windy, and fly fishing in the wind is really difficult. Oh. And uh, m- most guys didn't do very well. I did really badly. Really, really <laughs> badly. Uh, I caught nothing the whole day, fished probably about eight hours and caught nothing. That sounds so exhausting. It wasn't exhausting. It was really frustrating though. Oh. Uh, it was one of those days where like I saw other guys catch fish Yeah. and I saw where the fish were supposed to be. Yeah. And I saw places where I thought I could have caught fish and I didn't. And it was just frustrating because every time, every single time I thought I had the spot <laughs> Nothing would come up. I couldn't uh, get anything. I just realized I, I didn't realize you were going to give us an entire description of how you get to where you were. Oh, yeah. So I feel like whoever's listening to this might just join you on your trip next time. The, if you're going to the same they place. They might have to. There's no cell phone service. There's no There's no internet. <laughs> it is complete forced I mean, you already gave it's all glorious. the directions that are needed. It is glorious. <laughs> it's so wonderful. So then the second day of, of fishing, um, or yeah, the second day fishing was the, the really windy day when I caught nothing and I was hugely disappointed. Then the third day it rained and it rained like crazy. It was 45 degrees. Oh, that's awesome. It was great. Like in, in terms of the, the, the temperature being different from what we're having right now, which yes. is 90 degrees and yes. humid. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was 45 degrees, cold, <sighs> wet, rainy, delightful. Uh, but the river kind of filled up with mud. So what happens when it hasn't rained for a while is mm. whatever is dry and dusty hanging out right by the river just goes into the river. And mm. so uh, the river got really muddy, which means it's really difficult to fish because the fish aren't coming up to the surface because they can't see anything at the surface. Mm-hmm. So you've got to throw something that's called nymph fishing. So you throw in like a, a nymph, which is a weighted, uh, a, a weighted fly along with a dry fly that floats on top of the water. Mm-hmm. That day I caught eight fish. 
<laughs> I don't know what happened. So the circumstances had to be very difficult. I had, I had zero experience with, with nymph fishing before. <laughs> I had never, I had, I'd maybe done it once and, and had no success at all. And here I am trying it in terrible conditions. I'm wearing a raincoat over my, over my waders. I'm standing freezing cold in this, in this water and just pulling fish out. Like you wouldn't believe it was great. I was so excited that day, the day before I caught nothing that day, I was the only one in our entire group who caught anything. <laughs> So I have I have no explanation. So for, for God, it. all things are possible. Exactly. And that was exactly. that's that's the only thing I'm thinking well, about right I, now. I got to thinking about it. All right. So there's there are spiritual lessons in fly fishing. Yeah. And I firmly believe that. And and I started thinking about how my frustration with my my own inability uh, the day before mm -hmm. and how it, it, I felt like a personal failure. Like I just I wasn't able to get anything. And I I knew that I was doing things right. I knew that I was doing all the stuff that I was supposed to do mm -hmm. and it didn't seem to be working. Mm. I thought how like how often that happens in the spiritual life where I'm praying, I'm doing these things, I've got these devotions, I'm, I'm doing this stuff and, and nothing seems to be happening. Yeah. And it's frustrating. Yeah. But then to be to be cognizant of how frustrated you are mm -hmm. is actually a really good thing. Be aware that you're frustrated, that you're not happy about this and, and move on with your life. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's part of what we're going to have to deal with. Let's name it. This is frustrating right now. Yeah. And then we, we keep going. Well, the next day, what if I didn't go out the next day? Mm -hmm. What if I said, oh, it's it's going to be too difficult. Yeah, if you didn't show up. These conditions aren't good. The day before was was better. Mm -hmm. Objectively, the conditions were better, even though they were difficult because of the wind. The next day, with all that rain and the cold, it was not pleasant to go out and do it. But I said, no, I came here to fish. I'm going outside. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and at the very least, I'm going to try something that I've never tried before. And I did it. And there was success. And I realize sometimes that's what the Lord asks us to do, to step into something that's uncomfortable and maybe literally. Yes. So 45 degrees standing in a cold river while it's raining uh, is not comfortable. Yeah. But then he also asks us sometimes to, to step out and do something a, a little bit different than what we've ever done before. So I was fishing in a way that I had never fished before. Mm -hmm. I got eight fish. That's so cool because when you go on retreats or conferences, sometimes you think the Lord is going to – do the exact same thing that he did before. And so you were doing that. You did what you knew. Mm -hmm. And God's like, hey, try something different, which is really a growing, like, that's, a, oh, man, God is so good like that. I want you to grow in a new area of, of faith with yeah. me and a new thing that you think you might not be capable of. Um, but because of my power, you will, you will have it. it yeah. That's so amazing. Yeah. Wow. And, and so you start to, yeah. as, as you're reflecting on it, you start seeing these spiritual lessons. Now the good mm -hmm. part of this entire trip was that it was 12 guys and we were there both to fish and to pray. Mm. So every day, morning prayer, mass, we prayed Vespers when we came back together before we had dinner. Mm -hmm. So there was a, an attitude of, of prayer surrounding the whole thing. And what happened this year, different from previous years, uh, was it wasn't just limited to those times when we were gathering to pray, but the conversation was turning to God a lot, mm. a lot. It was really cool. One of the guys who was with us was the, he was Lutheran, the only Lutheran who came with us. Oh, cool. Wait, how did you guys all know each other before this? We had actually never met him. He's, he's from Montana. Um, oh. And this guy was amazing. Yeah. He was just amazing. He was so much fun to be with. <laughs> he had stories like you wouldn't believe. He, he just... <laughs> He was entertaining to talk to, but a man of profound faith, mm. really, truly deep faith. Uh, at one point we were talking and he said to me, hey, you know, Father, I think you're going to do okay as a priest. And I, ah! and I said, well, I've been at it for 13 years. I hope I hope that's true. <laughs> at this point, if I haven't figured it out, I might be in some trouble. I mean, if you didn't have your beard in this situation, yeah. you would have thought you just became a priest. Right, right. Yeah. But it was, it, it was just really good talking with him. But here's something that happened, and this is kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was coming to mass every day with us and praying and he talked to me at one point. He said, you know, I was, I was going to come up for communion and I didn't, I didn't have to say anything to him because he had decided not to, mm. but I would have had to say, well, you can't receive communion right? Um, because even though it's very, very evident that he shares faith with us. Yeah. And in fact, he believes in the true presence. Mm. He believes that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus. So he has, he has the faith, he mm -hmm. believes it, but he's not, he's not with us in the church. He's not, right. a, he's not a Catholic. And he said, I, I was, I was going to do it, but I, I realized that the only reason I was thinking about doing it wasn't because I felt like spiritually that's what God wanted from me, but because I, 
I kind of felt like I should just do what everybody else was doing. And he said, and I, I didn't want to do that because I knew that that wasn't the right reason mm. to do it. And I was really moved by how he said it because first of all, he was super honest, mm -hmm. really honest about it. Yeah. But second, because when he, when he spoke about that, he was, he was recognizing that there's something in his heart moving, but that it wasn't necessarily the movement of the Holy Spirit that he was paying attention to. Mm. And he didn't want to pay attention to the thing that wasn't from God. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to pay attention to the thing that was his own comfort, his own, his own, his own voice. Exactly. Yeah. He wanted to pay more attention to what God was doing. So here's, here's what I wanted to talk about that. First of all, I saw in him a longing for communion Mm -hmm. and a recognition that communion matters. And I don't know how often we as Catholics recognize how much communion matters. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the act of receiving communion, like just that, like what we receive, that the Eucharist matters. I think we do recognize how much the Eucharist is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But do we realize what the, what the act of receiving means on its deepest level? Mm -hmm. Because communion, as much as it influences me, I get the Eucharist. Communion is not about me. No. And so the act of receiving the Eucharist is not, uh, uh, it's not only about me, but it places me in communion with everyone else. This idea of, of sharing in the communion of faith, mm -hmm. that we share the faith together. And actually the, the guys on, on Catching Foxes talked about this in their, their last episode. Uh, so, so are you plagiarizing? No, no, we're, we're not plagiarizing because <laughs> I, I wanted actually, I was really kind of inspired by what they were talking about yeah, to, yeah. to go a little bit further. Yeah. They, were, they were talking about how faith we profess the faith of the church. Yeah. Right. So after the, the, our father look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. So don't look at what I have done individually, but look at the faith of the church Yeah. that the church's faith. And this is what we ask in baptism. What do you ask of God's church? The faith. Give me the faith that that means that the, the church already has it. Mm -hmm. It's not about what I have going in, although I want to get to that place where I'm making the act of faith myself on a personal level. Yeah. But it's rather about what the church professes. So the church believes all these things. We, we read the creed and this is what we believe. But that comes from something other than myself. I didn't arrive at the creed on my own. The church already professed it, and I came to understand what the church professes so that I could make the church's profession of faith my own. Mm -hmm. It wasn't I, cho I chose to believe. It was that there was this faith already existent that was then shared with me, and I was mm -hmm. brought into it. Well, that's what communion is. Mm -hmm. There is, a, there is a, a great community that extends beyond me. There's more than just me involved. It's not just what I want or what I prefer, but there's this great community, uh, this great communion of faith, and I'm brought into it. Mm -hmm. When I receive the Eucharist, I'm brought into it. Yeah. So it's not about me. But so often that's what we think in our spiritual life, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's me. I have to do it. Mm -hmm. I have to be the one. I have to be the, the one doing it. And like the church has to be the one providing the community for me. But I have to somehow, but like it, it all depends on me. This is like our mm. American Protestant mentality, right? <laughs> this is this is where we become American we Lutherans, get it American Congregationalists. Yeah. Like if I just if I just work hard enough, then then, then something's happen. going to happen. But yeah. No, rather this is recognizing ourselves to be part of something so much greater, so much bigger. And it's really profound. Mm -hmm. So Liam last week, I don't know if you heard the podcast already. No, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to listen. So I gotta, I gotta give yeah. it a shot. So as soon as we came back, he stressed, he realized it was probably, I remember you said something like community and I like say it a lot because I hope they understand, sure. but because of community, he comes to adoration every, every Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Um, he goes, yeah, like a bunch of us just meet up and then we go like, go for ice cream or five guys later. And he's recognizing his, yeah, I'm really starting to see what you meant by community, that you can't live the Christian life without it. There's no way. I mean, like, <laughs> saints come in clusters. There's, if there's a saint, you're going to find like their BFF right there. And they're most likely a saint, right. you know, because they formed each other. They were with each other. They held each other accountable. But I also love this idea that in, or you ever say like, let's say you're saying goodbye to like a good friend, you know, like a good Catholic friend. And you're not sure when you're going to see them. There's this uh, colloquial response. See you in the Eucharist. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you in the Eucharist. Well, that, that was always the joke with 
uh, guys in seminary when a, a girl they knew entered the convent. Because <laughs> we always knew, like, hey, this this girl's entering the convent. We're not going to be able to even speak to her for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, so see you in the Eucharist, and I'll pray for you while you're in the convent. And you pray for me. Yeah. And there, there, I can tell you, a lot of guys, myself included, who know women who entered religious life. And we would say we got through seminary because they were praying for us, even <laughs> though we couldn't talk to them. And what's beautiful is how the friendship doesn't disappear. Yeah. You know, and, and that's part of the community, too. Mm -hmm. You ever run into somebody who was part of your community at one time? Oh, yeah. But maybe you wouldn't consider part of your community today because you don't get to see them. Mm -hmm. But when you do have that chance to see them, it's, you just pick up right where you left off. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because of the faith that you share. It's not because of, of the friendship necessarily. Mm -hmm. There are some friendships that you pick up right where you left off every time, no yeah. matter what. But some of those those particular Catholic friendships that are, are really rooted in, in the faith, you realize that it's the communion that you share yeah. uh, in professing the faith, in prayer, in belief. That's what always binds you. And that's mm. what makes the, the conversation so natural every time. Mm-hmm. And... I love this image too. Someone had said this, that the blood of Jesus is running through us. Like we are all of one, like we, tr ah, you're truly a graph to the person of Jesus Christ. But just that, that one thought that inside of me, like we are all running with the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like just, just, just sit with that for like a second. It's powerful. Uh, talk, it? talk about like blood brothers and sisters. <laughs> okay. Like, Take it to a whole new level. Whoa, wait, like that's really cool. I'm just thinking like, you know, that like, people make those like blood bonds or those packs, yeah. like they prick their finger. Yeah. I'm like, we get it through the Eucharist. Um, but it's just a really, really powerful image to think about that the same blood that's running through me because of the Eucharist is running through like you. It's like wild. I still don't know what to make of it. Yeah. But then you see that that longing for community. Like, I desire this. I, yeah. I want to be with others. I, I realize mm -hmm. that I can't do this on my own. This yeah. this faith can't be only just just me. But then at the same time, I have to realize like, what happens on those days. I'm I'm Catholic. What happens on those days when I'm struggling? Mm -hmm. What happens on those days when my prayer isn't very strong? Yeah. What happens on those days when I'm having a hard time believing? What happens on those days when I'm failing morally? Mm -hmm. Am I out of the communion? And I am I out of faith? Does that mean that I don't believe at all? No. And then you realize, no, that's the beauty of what the church provides us with, because the church believes even when I can't. Mm -hmm. And the church professes that faith even when I can't profess it myself. Yeah. And it isn't just that the church professes the faith even even when I can't, but that the church is there also to then bring me back through the ministry of the church. Yeah. May God give you pardon and peace. Yeah. Right? Through the church's ministry, I'm brought back into the communion that I need. Mm -hmm. I'm strengthened. And in fact, the church makes up for those things that I am lacking. Mm -hmm. Not in everything. I still have personal responsibility. Please don't. don't <laughs> I'm not suggesting that just because the church exists and you're part of the church, then you're off the hook for anything that, that you ever do. No, <laughs> but the, the, the church is there to, to help me come, come back and to return on that personal level. To yeah. The community. So I had a conversation really about this recently with somebody and you know, they had a powerful experience with God. Then life just happened it wasn't like a decision that they decided, Oh, you know, I'm just going to step away. It just life got so hectic in this person's life that before they know it, they look back and a year had gone by a year and a half and they just don't feel God's presence. Mm -hmm. They're like, I don't even know if this happened. Um, or like, why bother, you know, kind of start questioning, like, why should I follow the morality of the church? And a lot of it got me thinking, um, you know, just, just sitting there and, especially when you're like fresh off an experience with the Lord and you haven't built up that habit of like growing in the virtues necessary to keep persevering in the faith. Uh, but also what I've realized, I don't know, I've only been like a really true Christian for maybe 12 years. And I love that as time goes on, I grow. I, I like to think that I grow in wisdom. <laughs> I think that's a part of it. And more and more in my believing of, the truth that God never tires of calling us back into communion with mm -hmm. him and how in your early years they are so formative, but when you're really beginning that relationship with God, 
if you experience a fall, if you experience like doubt or like life is just hitting you really hard, you just kind of take it as like, oh, well, it's not, not going to work anymore. Like we're done. This is it. Like it's just not going to happen. Um, but God never stops pursuing us through his church. And what a gift that he's going to use people in order to communicate the gospel back to us to remind us, but that God is not tired with us. And something in us believes that he's just, well, he's, he's done with me. I'm like, he's got to be tired with me. I'm just not getting it. I'm just not like receiving it or I don't believe it anymore. That's not enough for God to stop pursuing you. And I think you, you really get to a point where you believe, um, not, I don't want to say believe, but I don't know if this is the right word, a maturity or just like this understanding of who you are as God's beloved, but forever, like you're, you're going to belong to him, um, is to believe that you've been loved at all times. Um, cause what does sin do? Sin doesn't all of a sudden it makes you think that God is done with you and that you are not loved, that God has stopped singing over you. Mm. Um, but like at all moments, God has never stopped loving you. Like he's never stopped thinking about you. He's never stopped loving you into existence, even in like your most detrimental like self or in a moment that you're just experienced like this great yeah. misery, like God has never stopped loving you. And it's so hard for us to even think of communion with God because it's something that's constantly being challenged is, do I believe I'm loved right now? Or am I only loved when I'm performing well and God seems to be pleased with what I do? Yeah. Um, well, right there, the, the idea of performance, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't catch any fish one day. And I was frustrated with myself, mm -hmm. but in a certain way, I, yeah, why why get frustrated when you, you're not catching fish that you don't need, for one thing? I wasn't eating them. It didn't matter, right? <laughs> but why get frustrated? Well, because it felt like I wasn't performing. Yeah. And and somewhere in that, you know, if you, if you get frustrated about something, like there's there's always some spiritual component of that. Oh yeah. Uh, we might not always recognize it right away, but there's always something where there's there's a little piece there, and there's a little piece of me mm -hmm. that believes I have to perform, mm -hmm. and even if it's not the dominant thing, and even if it's not the thing that I'm I'm focused on all the time. There's a little piece of me that thinks I have to perform in order for God to love me. Yeah. That's there. Um, it's. In my case, I, I've never experienced that as the dominant thing, but I know that there's a piece of it that does exist. In the, in the same way, I think there's that piece where I, I believe I have to perform if I'm going to have people love me. Mm -hmm. I have to do things so that that I'll be loved by the people around me, mm -hmm. whether that's that's family members, friends, parishioners, whatever. Um, and so I, I, I've got to learn how to know when that's happening and then be reminded of the truth, the truth that... God's not looking at my performance, mm -hmm. but rather God wants me to recognize that my performance is his, belongs to him. Mm -hmm. What I do really ultimately belongs to him. And he wants it to be a certain way. He does desire that it be a certain way, but that's, that's for blessing. That's for good. That's not, mm. that's not a, a question the, of his judgment on me. No, that's just him being a good father wanting to give good gifts to right. his children. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Like when you, when you sit in that space, like, oh, you, and you can proclaim, um, I came up with this word the other day. I'm like, like if we can just claim what God has proclaimed, I know it was like a play on words, but I was like, wait, there's something profitable. Like, what is Jesus promise that I just need to claim a little bit more in my life and, and believe in it. But, um, yeah, it just, we need to be there for each other though. I mm -hmm. think that's the other important part. Like I can only be reminded about community. Like, yes, God's grace is going to totally work in there. Um, but when God shows up with specific people to interrupt your life with the gospel again and again, you're like, dang it, Lord. And sometimes you actually, and I remember just a couple of times, like moments in my own spiritual life where there have been moments like stop pursuing me. Like you kind of want to keep God <laughs> and just leave, leave me, me alone. alone. <laughs> I've had enough of you. I want, I want an out, but then God's like, no. Yeah. Well, there, there's those moments too, where you, you know that God is at, at work, but you want to take that step back and rest. Yeah. You know that God is at work, but you'd prefer to to do something else. And it, it's not that you're you're unwilling to serve. It's not that you're not interested in, in the life of prayer, but you, you just want to stay in one thing for a little while 
and the Lord says, no, it's time to time to take this step. The other times, though, where you're saying, God, please move me on, like help me get beyond this, and I'm I'm just stuck in it. And he's like, stay there, <laughs> stay right there. I need you there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it it can be frustrating, you know. I I was thinking about this the 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 way in which we sometimes um, as we get caught up in in just our own desire for comfort. Mm -hmm. God brings us to something totally different that we didn't expect. Yeah. God brings us out of that desire for comfort and into instead a, just a totally different way of behaving, of living. And what a radical thing that is that he's like, no, come, come here, come check this out instead. And sometimes it's by, by force, sometimes it's not. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, this is so true. Us. That's why I'm laughing. Yeah, he surprises or like yeah. you go in and you you're uncertain about who you're gonna meet, who these people are, what it's gonna be like yeah. to, to be around them, and, and all of a sudden you discover that these guys are really like wonderful human beings. Yeah. These people are, are really good for you and, and you you weren't looking for new friends. Yeah. You weren't looking for a new experience, you weren't looking for any of this, but God's giving it to you. Yeah. And when God gives it to you, he's he's offering you something. And then sometimes we pass up the opportunity. Yeah. You know, like we, we ignore it or we forget about it. Mm -hmm. um, even this morning I was coming across the parking lot and like, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm doing a little bit of internal examination and penance, even as I talk about this, and there, there was a, a lady walking through a young mom with, with two of her kids in a stroller. And, uh, she said, good morning. I said, good morning. And, and her, her daughter asked me about the playground, like from the stroller, mm -hmm. you know, it was adorable. It was so cute. As so I had a little conversation with them, mm -hmm. And told him, yeah, I have a great day. It's really nice to nice to have you. And I, I kept going, and and then I realized I have no idea what her name is. <laughs> and I I never introduced myself. It was just sort of a, a a pleasant interaction. But I'm going, I should have I should like, where is my hospitality? Why didn't I invite them? Who, who are these people? Are they Catholic? They probably are. She called me father. She knew I was a priest. What am I doing? And there's this this whole like just the wheels turning in my head. I, I missed an opportunity maybe to evangelize or did I do something yeah. where I should have invited them and then they could have become part of the community here and did I deprive them of that and what's wrong with me? Maybe they're already parishioners and I just didn't I'm recognize them. I'm getting stressed them. just listening to you right now. Exactly, but this is like this is how I go. And then, then you realize, hey, this is the good news about the faith not being all about us. Yeah. Like it doesn't all depend on me. The proclamation of the faith doesn't all depend on me. I have a role. I'm part of it. Yeah. But it's not all about me. Likewise, the church and the faith of the church and the graces that God wants to give are not all about me and what I do, but rather that the grace flows. Anyway, this is yeah. the other cool part, right? Think about this, that the God gives us the sacraments through the church so that his grace can be present in the world. Yeah. And in fact, this is in, in in the Second Vatican Council when we talk about how the church exists in the world as a sacrament. In other words, it's, it's awesome. through the church that God's grace is poured out on the world again and again and again. God's grace is poured out on the world whether or not people are part of the church. The grace is still flowing, but it's because the church is there to provide that grace. Yeah. Then when people start receiving God's grace in different ways, they're receiving it really through the ministry of the church. Yeah. And so it's by the Catholic Church's existence and the sacramental life of the church that this grace is flowing. And this got me thinking too about how that grace is there and God is at work through the church even when I can't participate or when I'm not I'm not fully there. But then I started thinking, you know, as we're going through another stupid spike of this COVID nonsense, <laughs> you know, and I started thinking about what was it that motivated me back in quarantine times when we couldn't go anywhere, we couldn't do anything, we couldn't have public mass. What, what motivated me to get up every day? It was, it was that the mass itself is valuable mm -hmm. and to celebrate the mass, whether or not people can be there is valuable, that there's grace that flows through the mass, mm -hmm. that God wants to pour out his grace and his mercy on the world through the mass. And so this idea, like we just had the hurricane that wasn't, at least for us, it, <laughs> it was wasn't. so pathetic. Well, where for where, us, for it was us, pathetic. it was there pathetic. There are other places that got flooding and things yes. like that. We got nothing. It, yeah. was, it was kind of a letdown. A lot of people were looking for a show, you which is weird. Well, why? It's, why? I know, but like, <laughs> everybody, there's... can't you be amazed at the wind and no. and, and how the wind blows no, just, and the way that the storm works? It's funny because someone someone made this meme video. I think I told you already. I don't know if I told you, but the, someone made this meme video. Like people in the Midwest, when there's tornado warning, they go right down to the basement. 
Uh, people in New England, hurricane category one at their window eating cereal. Yeah, exactly. Because they're like, what's going to happen? Ready. We can't wait to see. We got, we got to watch. Same thing with blizzards, <laughs> right? They're like, hey, you, you should really stay off the roads. Like, let's go outside and drive around for a while. I am guilty of this. Yeah, because I think it's this might be really cool. Anyway, so. <laughs> Dangerous is cool. Here comes here comes like the, the hurricane. And I don't remember what I was going to talk about with the hurricane. Why was I talking about the hurricane? I don't know. I'm not in your Something head. Something about mass. Something about mass. What was it? What was I talking about? Dude, that's on you. Can, can you believe this? <laughs> I haven't had this happen in so long. Okay, that's what happens to me. I know. This is this isn't supposed to happen like this. No, hang Actually, on, hang I on. Like I've this. got this. No, I've got this. No, I've got this, this is good. This is mass quarantine. Mass is valuable. Community, so, why you were getting up? Community, why was I getting up to something mass? Because what motivated? Yeah. Motivated me to hurricane came. <laughs> I don't remember what I wanted to say about the hurricane. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is too great. <laughs> I have great. no recollection <laughs> at all. You really don't? I complete blank. It's just, but you have I'm, such a great memory. I know that's the thing. I'm just drawing a complete blank You're on this aging. one. You're aging. Oh, I am old. Let me <laughs> tell you, I am old. I had one of those days where like I sneezed and my back hurt, and I'm like, <laughs> I think it's gonna hurt forever now. That's so funny. You know? <laughs> okay, well, I I had a thought. Okay, okay so give, I actually wanted this they, might this might remind me of why I was thinking about the, the may, hurricane. I don't okay, know. it may or may not, but we'll just go with it. So I have been doing a lot better with my holy hours lately. Good for you. And it's a struggle, man. But you need somebody to hold you accountable to do them. So I've been very grateful for that accountability. Um, second, when I did my holy hour on Sunday. Up until this point, like I'm reading through Romans, so I'm like kind of going through scripture. Romans is awesome. I hate so folks. If you haven't read Romans, uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, please do yourself a favor. Read St. Paul's letter to the Romans. It's so there's good. some powerful encouragement in this. This is the cool thing. Yeah. There's the powerful encouragement in there, like that you can take on a personal level. But mm -hmm. then you realize he's really he's writing to the church. He really is. He He's really writing is. to the church. This is who you are. This is what you are. Not just as as a community, like, hey, isn't this nice that we're all together? Yeah. But he's writing to the Romans as a, as a, a church community, reminding them of what the church is. It's profoundly it, ecclesiological. And it's like little bits of like, this is what life in the spirit is like. Yeah. This is how you pray. This is how you. It just. It's so beautiful. This is what it means to have faith, and and what it takes to be saved. It just. It's incredible. So. I usually come in with my journal, which has Italian leather, and it's amazing. Um, it's such a beautiful journal. Bible uh, by Armani. <laughs> and then, like, my Bible from uh, Ascension Presents, you know, the Bible, uh -huh. not the Bible in the year, the, uh, the, that, yes. that one, the, the blue thing. Bible. The Great Adventure yes. Bible. I love it. So uh, I'm always prepared for Holy Hour. You know, you kind of come in with a game plan when you're not really sure what's going to happen. And as soon as I sat down on Sunday... Uh, I remember what it was. Go I'm ahead. so glad. I just just as I'm you. going I, to... I just, need, yeah, I just need to tell you that I remember what it was now. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. You're sitting down. No. So I was sitting down and, you know, I asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, teach me how to pray. 20 minutes had gone by and I didn't notice. I had, I was literally, I had my hands open um, just in this place of receptivity of just receiving what God wanted. And my body was physically consumed for about an hour. Mm. I did not, it felt like I was in there for 10 minutes, but I was in there for an hour and I just started, oh, it was just so beautiful. It was just a time of just like praising Jesus. The Lord just wanted to give me the good gift of having, I honestly, it was like a taste of heaven. Did you cry? No. I mean, I did. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought about it after, after you asked that question. Listen, this is how I was made and we're going to own it's, it. It's beautiful. It's, be it's beautiful. But it, and I'm proud of you. What was so beautiful was just sitting there and I'm like, this is all prayer is, is me sitting in a place of receptivity, being gazed on by my Lord who wants to give me heaven. Yeah. Like that's it. And I'm crying right now, but you know, <laughs> sorry. Unless you're like watching this on like the YouTube, you'll see know, it. Know, it's just, it's, I'm it's glazed there. over. It's glazed. Yeah. It, it's not it, falling. Yeah, the tear hasn't fallen yet. But it was it just, will. it was, it was just, it was just a great gratitude of um, how desperately the Lord wants intimacy w with me and how I'm constantly forgetting this. But you do have to place yourself in a position of receptivity. Is my heart open and docile to how the Spirit wants to work in my day to day? Um, the graces that I need. And, you know, the day before I was falling asleep in holy hours. So like 
Like I said, every day is a little bit different. Some days are really, truly a spiritual experience and right. other days you are working to persevere just to make it through. Yeah. Just to, just to spend the time. Just to spend see, the time. This is just it, right? Yeah. Jesus is there. Jesus is present in the Eucharist and, and he's there. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He's able to pour out graces upon you because you showed up. Yeah. And that's part of the beauty of, of making that time. So if you if you have a time for prayer, whether it's an hour or you have 15 minutes that you want to dedicate to prayer, if you're getting distracted or you're feeling like I don't have anything to offer, mm -hmm. stay. Just sit. Stay. Yeah. Be there because when when you stay in that in that place, you're allowing Jesus to to work. Well, again, we come back to this idea that I have to do everything. Exactly. It depends on me. Yeah. And if, if I'm not doing it, then then nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. We forget that that God is the one who's really at work. That He's the one who's who's going to pour out graces. He's the one who's trying to build us up. You know, and, so and, that's why we stay in it. Yeah, because and, it doesn't depend on me. Now, that doesn't mean that it there's I don't have any role to play. Right. I should try to stay focused on my prayer. I should make the effort. I should have a plan going in. I should show up. Yeah. But it doesn't all depend on me. It doesn't exclusively depend no. on me. And then more importantly to realize, though, is that our going into prayer is actually our response. God right. was the first mover in this situation. Right. God no, is always you, the first mover. Right. You didn't just decide, I think I'm going to pray today. No, you're actually just responding to a quiet invitation from the Holy Spirit to spend time with the eternal God. That's right. Like, you have been invited every single time. I'm like, then when you think God has been first mover in all things, mm, that should change the way you live your life. Mm. It's just, ah, it's so good. Like you didn't do anything. I love we're just communicating with noises now. That's, that's really good. That's the way to do it. Okay, here's the thing I remembered. Okay, I'm so glad. Well, because it, it comes back to this, right? Yeah. I, I was talking about how during the, the quarantine, that, that idea that mass is valuable, even if nobody can be there, and it's because grace is poured out through the mass. Well, then we get like the hurricane. And this is something that drives me nuts every time there's bad weather. You'll hear about churches that are saying mass is canceled. Well, first of all, you, you ought not to cancel mass because you have an intention probably for that mass. Mm -hmm. And you are obligated, my friend, by canon law to celebrate mass for the intention. So you better celebrate that mass. Yeah. Now, if you want to tell people you should not come to mass because of the four feet of snow that are falling on the ground right now or because everything is ice or because the hurricane is literally going to pick up your car as you try to drive to mass, then that's that's a, a safe <laughs> thing to do. But you can't cancel mass unless I am physically prevented from getting to the church to celebrate mass mm -hmm. unless it is physically impossible for me either because of the weather or because i'm i'm vomiting violently or something like that unless there is something preventing me from being there yeah i can't cancel a mass i still have to say that mass and if i get into the attitude that oh it's fine to just to just cancel stuff then what i'm actually doing is saying that the grace that that mm. God pours out on the world mm -hmm. through this mass, in spite of my own imperfections and fragility, in spite of my own inabilities and the 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 lack of attention or the lack of reverence that I might have, God is still at work through that. Even even on my worst day, God is still at work, and I do not have the right to deny that grace. Mm. I do not have the right to deny the world that grace. But then the same thing I think is true for just personal prayer. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to say, well, I don't feel it today. And I, how many times have I fallen into that? Mm -hmm. right? I just don't feel it today. Mm -hmm. But you know, now that I think about it, I don't have the right yeah. to deny God that, that access. Mm. I don't have the right. Because, I mean, if you really want to get deep and Catholic guilt it, <laughs> <laughs> I, we're not even worthy of forgiveness. Well, you know, like we're not, yeah, we're mean, not, a, we're like a question of our worthiness is, is oh, not one worthy, thing, right, right, right. Or deserving. I'm sorry. Deserving of, so there's so many things we're not even deserving of, but God does it anyway, but God does it anyway. Yeah. And, and, uh, man, so my struggle sometimes to say yes to prayer. Eesh. It's real. It's I, real. I, I, we it's should never totally deny that. Real. And this is the thing we sometimes start to feel bad. I'm having a hard time with this. Therefore it's bad. I'm yeah. bad. Look, we need to be able to recognize this is where I'm, I'm not doing super well. Or this is where I'm, I'm kind of struggling, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't think therefore I'm, I'm bad or I'm like, I'm failing at something. No, this is the struggle. Acknowledge the struggle, recognize that this is right. where it's difficult. And now let's bring that to God. Let's give it to him and ask him for his help. So even that, that whole idea of I, I want to be in communion, but I'm having a hard time uh, with, I'm having a hard time with a friend of mine. We had a mm -hmm. fight. 
Um, I'm angry at this person. That's the struggle in communion. That doesn't mean you're not in communion. It just means there's there's a wound there. There's a there's a struggle. Right. Let's, and let's bring it to the Lord. In the words of uh, Saint Jose Maria Scriva, struggle is a sign of holiness. Yeah, <laughs> engaged the right way. Well, engaged you know? the right way. Okay, yes. Like especially if you're you're really persevering virtue. Yeah. Like this is why we do have to have lives of virtue and and character. Um, it goes with living a life that is whole. Um, so the one thing that I wanted to share once I get to it, it's Romans, Romans. 12, 12. Yeah. Rejoice in hope. Oh. Endure in affliction. Whatever. Persevere in prayer. Never mind. We're done. He already said it. Romans 12, 12. It's on my holy card for my ordination. No. That's the verse that I chose. <laughs> That's it. That's Romans all. 12, 12. I was going to share. Rejoice said, in hope. Endure I in affliction. I should have just asked Persevere you. in prayer. What is it? Romans 12, 1 though. Um, I urge you, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord our God. Which is your spiritual worship. Yeah. Yeah. Do not be conformed to this world. This was the thing that changed my life. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I was in seminary with a guy, and he had that as his email signature. Mm. It was always there. And one day he, uh, he had called my room and left me a message. And so I got back and I had the message from him and he's like, all right, thanks. And I could hear him going to hang up and then I could hear him pull the phone back and he just yells, Romans 12, one. And he hangs up. <laughs> <laughs> so even on a phone call, even on a phone signature. call, he was leaving it. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. 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 But Offer I, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, who is your spiritual worship. Yeah. To offer yourself to God. Mm-hmm. But see, that's that's what that's what prayer is. That's what the life of prayer is, and ultimately, that's what communion is all about. It's about offering ourselves to God, and then He brings us into this life with with others. So that desire for communion mm-hmm. that exists, I think, in every Christian heart. Yeah. It's it's really powerful. So here's the one of the other things I, I noticed with this this Lutheran guy who is with us. He believes. He believes in the real presence. When I meet Protestants, there are some who believe in the real presence, some some who don't. Mm-hmm. There are some who long for communion and some who don't. Mm. And I see the desire for communion, oddly enough, more commonly uh, with denominations that, at least around here, would typically not be considered super enthusiastic about faith. Oh, I totally agree. I, I see like with Episcopalians and with Lutherans, and those are typically denominations in our area yeah. that tend to seem more worldly in a lot of ways. Mm. Whereas a lot of the non-denominationals, the evangelicals, they're the ones who are like, here's the Bible, we believe in Jesus, let's worship. Mm-hmm. But the desire for communion is often absent from them. They, they're more mm. on the, uh, hey, it's great that you're doing this, uh, we're going to go do our thing. And uh, I don't as, know. Long as, as long as we all love Jesus, but this desire for communion, like on a, a deep level, communion, both desire for the Eucharist to be able to share the Eucharist together, mm-hmm. the desire to say like, no, we are really one. There's, there's a deep desire that is, that is, that's my experience. I, I, you know, it might not be yours, <laughs> mine is the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> No, my, mine has always been like, it's, it's these guys who, they have a sense of belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Yeah. And they desire communion. And they understand that communion is something that's going to have a sacramental form. Okay, yeah. It's not just going to be a, a matter of, of we believe the same thing. It's, yeah. It's got a sacramental form to it, that sacramental imagination. This is the whole point, right? This is what the guys on Catching Foxes were talking about. Mm-hmm. The sacramental life is the thing. Like God gave us the sacraments for a reason. So in, in my mind, when I've been to non-denominational services. So I actually experienced the opposite. It's like huh. they're, they're actually worshiping for the purpose of communion. No, sorry. So sorry. Like, I, I, don't, I don't mean at their services. Others, I mean, I mean the desire, like you I mean see sacri- you as a Catholic and I, and I, I know that communion is something that is good and we ought to try to have mm. it. And I want that communion. It's that desire for communion among Christians right. for denominational divides to fall. Oh, okay. It's that desire <clears throat> for community to say, no, like we belong together. And, and so if you have this this Lutheran gentleman, you know, he was he was there with us for mass every day. See, and, so we had so many differences of communion for a second. I was like, well, wait, which? that's true. That's true. There's there's a lot of different ways. No, like yeah. the desire for community, community. like let's oh, be yeah. together. That's yeah. always there. Oh yeah, yeah that's that's sure. there regardless of denomination. I think, but that desire for for communion to understand ourselves to be bound together in faith. Yeah. To be sharing in the life of grace together. And to be sharing in that life of grace together through the sacraments, through what the sacraments objectively do and mm-hmm. through what they symbolize. Yeah. 
there's that 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 deep desire is there and and if we would recover that deep desire i think that would also make us more evangelical i was gonna say and like and you're really going out into the world to bring all people to be one rather than okay i i'm understanding now. yeah okay. i can't but i can't evangelize if i don't have the eucharist mm -hmm. i can't evangelize if i don't know myself to be part of this great communion mm -hmm. right but communion is also not the the starting point for evangelization like mm -hmm. i don't and, and this is where I think we, we get into some some stuff where like, if I'm going to go out and evangelize, my first move, and this might sound really weird, my first move is not to say, hey, why don't you come to mass with me? Oh, I'm that's not weird. That's what I would do too. It's not the it's not the <clears throat> first move. Whereas yeah. if you in, in some of the non denominational churches, right, the first move is come to our come to our service. You'll really like it. I mean, we don't have a band. <laughs> well, we don't have a band, but that, but that's not and like why. really cool lights. <laughs> but, that, but see, that's because what we do is totally different. It's different. And, it, and what our, what our worship is, is totally different. But yeah. evangelization begins with, hi, yeah, this is my name and I'm, I'm here for you. That's why I'm disappointed in myself for not actually introducing myself to this mom and her, and her kids. Like I just, I was father in the parking lot and that was sufficient. And I didn't even think like, cause <laughs> my Connecticut came back. I was in Montana for a week where you wave to everybody when you drive by and, and my Connecticut came flooding back to me as soon as I got here. And it's like, <laughs> Why would I tell you my name? I don't know who you are. I've never seen you before. Go away. What do you want from me? You know, and I can't say that. Like, that's not what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be better than that. I'm disappointed in myself. This is yeah. my public confession, right? But <laughs> here we go. That evangelization begins with with friendship, with a, a relationship. And then that that leads to, let me share with you who Jesus is and, and why Jesus matters. And then eventually the mass is the thing that brings us into communion. The mass and, yeah. and that worship together is that, that thing that brings us to understand who we've been talking about mm -hmm. it's not the starting point yeah it's it's the end result good it's... evangelization always leads bishop Barron says to bodies in the pews mm. living bodies but oh, okay. you know? <laughs> <laughs> good evangelization means that we've brought people to to the mass eventually but it doesn't start with bodies like, that have been risen from the dead yeah. okay got but it. If, if i invite someone to say hey you should come to mass and they come to mass i'm not i haven't evangelized them yeah. I convince them they should come to mass. Yeah. That's not sufficient. Right. There's more. There's got to be more. There's got to be that relationship. But then that relationship is a reflection of the friendship is a reflection of the, the group that we might have is a reflection of the communion mm -hmm. that exists on that sacramental theological level. Mm hmm. Any any type of community, it's it's just a, a living sign of what what exists on that much deeper level. So, you know, Crossroads, I we, do. we do things here. Uh, we do things. <laughs> yes. So this past Tuesday, we decided to go out for dinner. And I thought it was going to be like, I think like maybe eight of us, something like that. People just kept showing up. Awesome. No, I, I was stressing out the hostess. I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> could we get one more chair? Every 10 minutes was a new person. Just bring us another table, so, please. <laughs> so there, I think, was... 15 or 16 of us at a table at Malibu, which is not a place to have that many people. Um, it's a taco place. That's, you know, Katie was like, we need to go somewhere. That's not pizza. Cause I need vegetables. I don't, I don't even know where that is. It's on the post road. I didn't really oh, know what it was. It's, taco place it's a taco road. place. Um, it was really good, but I was getting stressed out and I was like, Oh my goodness. But then I was thinking, someone said like, Paula, this is such a great problem to have that you had this many people come out for dinner before they went into adoration yeah. and how, the beauty of how community we were going, we gather around a meal, just like the early Christians would gather around a meal, um, spending time in fellowship with each other. But then you go in for the, well, it wasn't breaking of the bread. It wasn't mass, but it was still like, it was the Eucharist. It was like, now we're going to go spend time with Jesus. Um, now at this point I've decided if we're ever going to have another dinner, I have to get a party room of some sort. Um, that might not be a bad idea. No, it's not yeah. a bad idea, but also this place doesn't do reservations. So unfortunately oh. it made it a little bit difficult. Yeah. And they're like, all right. And so they had to take like stools from the bar oh, inside man. the restaurant. Cause we were sitting outside. Oh wow. So they have sitting, they have seating right at the sidewalk and oh, we became, we were that group. Yep. We, we were that group. Yep. Did you leave a good tip? They, t they, they added it into their bill. Did you, bill. did you add extra to the tip that they included in the bill oh don't worry we paid extra good i ended up paying extra that's, for that's it. the right thing to do like 
if they're going to take care of you, that means that they that they did a good job taking care of you. Oh, they did. And uh, they do have to add they they add the gratuity, but then like you got to give them extra. Oh yeah. That's, wow. That's yeah. that's a big deal. It was a, it was a lot of people. I, mean, I, be, I believe so much in like a good tip. I believe that's so important. Oh yeah. You know, I was talking to somebody. They said they, there was this one restaurant. They said we never get good service here. It's always terrible. It's it's it's, it's miserable and everything. Like, I've gone there so many times and I always have a great time. So what do you do for tip? Ten percent. Like, well, that's your problem. Ten percent. <laughs> I that's go in there, nothing. They know that I tip well. <laughs> Come on, just just add some extra. What's wrong with you? Well, the service isn't good. The service isn't good because they know you're going to be a lousy well, tipper. I mean, at this point, it's got to be more like Europe, where they just get paid well. Well, to do I, their stuff. I'd be fine with that too. Yeah. Yes, it just makes it makes it make it easier on everybody. Sure, sure. Um, you ever yeah. have, have one of those really talented wait staff though? Somebody should. They're just really good at waiting tables. They memorize your order. They yeah. they're, they're really. They don't attentive. write the notes down. They, they, but they yeah, just know. But they're just they're just good, and they're they're right there if you, if you need anything. We get to waiters. <laughs> I don't it just have you were talking about about going for tacos. Yeah, but I, so no, but I was, I was talking naturally about naturally thinking about about eating tacos brought me to fine dining <laughs> establishments. You know, that's just how it goes. Of course. I mean, I was trying to bring it to the Eucharist. Um, but, but what that's you, why you're better than me, Paola. Okay. <laughs> that's why you're better than me. That's no, why no. you're holy and I'm not. No, listen, I'm just, I'm just thinking about how Crossroads grew in this year. Like it started with the desire for me to have community it started with like four to five people that I knew. I'm yeah. like, do you guys want to get together? And then we're not even a year old and to see how many people have been invited to come yeah. and be a part of this group. Well, that's where, so community, community has its own evangelization power, mm -hmm. but Community again is just it's a, a reflection of it's not the whole thing. It's a reflection of communion. Yeah, and what communion really is mm -hmm. and This is where that that Desire that urge that effort that we make to to go out and make disciples to evangelize. It's it's all good We should be doing it. Absolutely But we always have to remember that there's that deeper foundation which is God's action towards us, mm -hmm. God's grace to us, and that grace that is ministered through the church, through the sacraments, that that grace is is flowing. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is tap into it to fuel the evangelization that we do. That's to it. Fuel the community. Just end it right there. For. That's all we Just got. That's it. That, that's there's nothing more to add. That's it. The power comes from the Lord. We tap into it. We go out. There's nothing else to add to this. It's true. That's it. It's just to be docile to this power and let it live in us. And then bam, bam, bam. Yeah, that's it. Like, it's just, it's just so good because God does all the work. We just show up. Yeah. And then every single time we're always amazed. I'm like, that's really cool. God. And you're like, this is what I do. I'm, I'm there for it. Yeah. It's so totally. great. I have nothing else to add. Can I tell you a story? You can tell me a story. All right. Just, just one, one quick story. This is going back to Montana okay. and, and fishing. Okay. <laughs> so especially in the evening, in the morning, we were a little bit quicker, like breakfast time. Let's, mm -hmm. let's eat and let's get out. We want to go fishing. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of the plan. And so that was kind of the conversation at breakfast was where are you going today? What are you, what are you going to do? But there was also just a lot of fraternity happening mm -hmm. where these guys, we were just, we were just talking and jokes with each other and there was a, a real ease about things but at dinner time the day has kind of ended so we'd talk about the fish we caught you should have seen the one we didn't catch it was enormous and it was always the story right that's, that's, that's a fisherman's <laughs> tale right we talk about all this stuff we'd have these these jokes going around the table and everything we'd always get to this one point where we're more or less finished eating and the silence would just kind of fall on the table but it was the kind of silence where it was like I don't need to say anything. I'm just really glad to be with you guys. <laughs> and it's not awkward. We're just going to sit here for a little bit. Meanwhile, women would just talk about for an hour how much they appreciate being there. <laughs> well, I was talking with one of the guys who was, who was on the trip afterwards. Uh, we, we were talking about something and throwing an idea around for uh, an, an approach to something. He said, well, I guess it could be kind of like kind of similar to what walking with purpose does. And I said, well, given what we just experienced, I said, 
walking with purpose is really amazing in the way that they do hospitality and really oh, yeah. welcoming people for that community. Oh yes. You know, they've got the, they've got tablecloths, they've got the triple decker, uh, snack holder. It's incredible. Uh, the, like the, the multi-tiered. You just get thing. excited for food. Yeah. They display things. They have scented candles and flowers on all the tables and everything. I said, we were just in Montana with this, with this group. We just threw the, the tray that we cooked it in on the table and everybody grabbed a fork and stuck it in and took their food. <laughs> we didn't have a tablecloth. We used, we used paper towels as our napkins and not one of us complained. We all thought it was great, right? <laughs> I think it would have been weird if we put a tablecloth on the table. <laughs> we would have thought that that was the strangest thing. And it was it was just kind of funny that this is this is just how like the differences are, but like man, we were together. And that was what we needed to mm -hmm. be together. Mm -hmm. And how naturally and easily that all kind of flowed and happened. Mm. It's fantastic. That's cool. Just fantastic. All right. Cool. Hey, I'm done. This was great. Um, thanks for letting me tell that last story. It yeah, was, yeah. It you... was dumb and didn't really add anything to the podcast, but now people. I mean, you to said it. it. I have, I have <laughs> taken another minute of their life, and they'll never get it back. <laughs> this is where I like to land. My name is Paula Pena. I'm Paula Sankuchuva. <laughs> <laughs>